We find ourselves this evening in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. I was mistaken this afternoon when I told Pastor that tonight we we're going to be doing James chapter 4, 1 through 6. Here we are all shooting guns and having a great time. And why are there wars and conflicts among you? <laughs> but that's next week. <laughs> okay. And we're not going shooting next Sunday afternoon, so oh well, shucks. <laughs> Okay, John, uh, James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. I'll read, follow along. Who is wise and has understanding among you? He should show his works by good conduct with wisdom's gentleness. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag and deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where envy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every kind of evil. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good works, without favoritism and hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. Let's pray together. Father, as we come this evening, we once again thank you for an opportunity to open your word together. And we recognize, Lord, that this word is there to build us up, to give us life, to uh, reprove us when we need reproof. And so we ask, Father, that your spirit would do uh, what is necessary in each of our lives as we look through this, that we might have good understanding and that we might go forth like we saw this morning, filled with your spirit, ready to do what you have for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, now remember, chapter 3 starts out with, don't have a lot of teachers, or don't become teachers. And the part of the pr purpose there is chapter 2 ended with examples of people whose faith showed itself through their behavior. Uh, a teacher is someone who, at least Lord willing, is studying the Word of God, learning things. And the problem with all of that is, once you've learned it, you're accountable for implementing it in your life. This is uh, something that James has been talking about since James chapter 1. Okay, what about the person that looks in the mirror of the Word, sees his natural face, and then walks away and forgets what kind of person he was? Uh, first of all, he is a hearer of the Word, but he's not a doer. And in so doing, he has deceived himself. Then in chapter 2, faith without works, it's worthless faith. One could question whether or not that kind of faith actually saves a person. So when we get into chapter 3, first persons he's talking to is those that want to be teachers. Okay? Uh, be careful because now you're going to be accountable for the things that you learn. Because the expectation is, is you're going to be living it. Uh, then he moves on to the tongue. You might get just about every area of your, of your Christian life in order walking with God, but there's one area that's always going to be an issue, and that's the area of the tongue. And again, faith without works is dead. Uh, as a Christian, we need to be recognizing this is the area that, boy, if there's not another area that we need the Spirit's filling, it's that area, because that's the quickest and easiest way uh, to find ourselves blowing it. And then he moves up in here to this uh, idea of wisdom from above, and again, in context, we're still uh, dealing with this whole faith without works is dead. And in the area of the tongue, what are people going to spew forth? Well, a lot of people, especially those who might be in the positions of teaching, are going to be sharing their wisdom, right? So this is all within context of that. And so the, he starts out with uh, earthly and heavenly wisdom, the test of wisdom in verse 13. Verse 13, who is wise and has understanding among you? He should show his works by good conduct with wisdom's gentleness. So he starts out with who among you? Some think this refers only to those who are the teachers or the would-be teachers, but it more likely applies to everyone. 
like the section on the tongue. So he, he starts talking to those who want to be teachers, but then when he moves to the tongue, he's not just talking to them, he's talking to everybody. And that would be the same case here. Uh, in effect, he is asking for them to consider their inner character and the spiritual condition of their soul. And I guess, again, how would they do that? Well, what comes out of the mouth? That which is in the heart. So that's how you examine. You're, you listen to the way you talk. You, you see some of the things that come forth, and that tells you a little bit about uh, your inner condition. So he moves on to wisdom. Uh, who among you is wise? The word for wise here is sophos. Uh, wise in the most general application. It was used by the Greeks to designate speculative knowledge, theory, or philosophy. For the Jews, it carried a deeper meaning of careful application of knowledge to personal living. Now notice that. Why? Well, James is of what ethnic heritage? He's Jewish, and he is talking to the Jewish brethren that are dispersed. And so how are we going to understand the word wise here? Not like a Gentile, but like a Jewish person. And so notice, again, for the Jews, it carried a deeper meaning of careful application of knowledge to personal living. This, again, is just like James chapter 1. You're not only the hearer of the word, but you're the doer of the word, okay? Okay. So who is wise and understanding among you? Uh, the un word understanding there is epistemon, intelligent, and dude with knowledge. It appears only here in the New Testament, and it carries the ideas of a specialized knowledge like a highly skilled tradesman or professional. So he's not asking who among you is a new believer in Christ, and therefore, no, no. He, he's talking about the people who think they're mature, and they have understanding of how life works, etc. Uh, the results, let him show. It's translating the errorist imperfect. Again, we don't know a lot about those things, but here's what's important. It, it makes it a command. This is a command, let him show. By good conduct, notice there's no specific area. So he's talking about in all the areas of life that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Those that are wise in their own eyes are normally arrogant, proud. Uh, when it comes to parenting, in today's day and age, we allow kids to make decisions about a lot of things way too early. Now, why do I say that? Because by the time they're about this big, they don't think they need information from you anymore. They are wise in their own eyes. The idea that they don't think they need information from you anymore is an arrogance that comes about because they've been making their own decisions. Now, what does a kid this size know about the uh, reality of life? He knows enough to know that if he falls down and skins his knee, it's probably going to hurt. But in reality, not much more. And so uh, it shows itself there. Now, the reality is, is there's a lot of people that are wise in their own eyes in the sense that what happens when you share the gospel with people? <laughs> I don't need that. You know, you need, in fact, what is Christianity? Christianity? Christianity is for the weak, those people that need a crutch. And we say, amen. <laughs> That's right. I, I'm, I'm weak. I need a crutch. If it wasn't for Jesus, where would I be? I would hate to imagine. Okay? I, I know the path that I was on, and I wouldn't doubt that I'd either be in jail or suffering the consequences of all kinds of wickedness and evil decisions that I would have made. Okay? So yeah, uh, true enough. But the person that's wise in their own eyes, they don't need Jesus. They can handle life. And when they need him, eh, you know, he'll give you a second chance at the great white throne and, you know, 
you still get in by the skin of your teeth. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Um, those that are wise in their own eyes are nor normally arrogant. The word uh, meekness of wisdom there is uh, proutes, mildness, humility, meekness. It carries the area, the idea of tenderness or graciousness or gentleness. It doesn't connote weakness, but power under control. Uh, Christ was a very meek person. Uh, Moses is called one of the meekest people in history. I mean, before he really got things straightened out with God, what did he do? He killed someone. So it wasn't a matter of not having strength. But after a while, he learned the only strength that I need is what I need from God. And so the, uh, that shows itself there. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. So the first is the test of wisdom, and then he moves on to false wisdom. Number one there, the motivation of false wisdom is found in verse 14. Verse 14 says, But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't brag and deny the truth. So first of all, bitter envy. The word there is uh, for bitter is uh, picross, uh, sharp, pungent, acrid, or bitter. Uh, envy is the word zealous, heat, zeal, favorable, ardor, unfavorable. Uh, if it's favorable, it's ardor. If it's unfavorable, it's jealousy. As of a husband. Uh, figuratively, it's of God. Or an enemy, it's malice emulation, envy, envying, fervent mind, indignation, jealousy, zeal. So uh, bitter envy obviously is going to be unfavorable, right? There's going to be a sharpness to uh, the way this person is bringing across any zeal that he has for whatever. Uh, bitter, the person that is bitter envy or has self-seeking, the word there is erytheia, uh, intrigue, faction, contentious, or strife, uh, the idea is ambition is implied. So they're more concerned with what they're wanting than what is good for the situation. It says, do not boast and lie against the truth. Uh, the word there, boasting, is katakauchaomai. Wow. Uh, to exult against or boast against, to glory, rejoice against. Uh, lying against the truth Thinking you are wise, but having bitter envy and selfish ambition is lying to yourself. You know, it's interesting that this idea of bitter envy and selfish ambition, Paul talks about that in the book of Philippians. Uh, what's going on? Let me see. There's a couple of women that are having conflict. Notice the idea of they're not having the meekness of humility or gentleness of uh, spirit, but there's some arrogance there. There's strife. Proverbs says, if you want to end strife, throw out the proud. And so here you've got these two women in the church. Paul knows who they are, and he uh, loves them in the Lord, but there's a problem. And uh, he brings in, goes from that into, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 2. Uh, so that's the idea here. It, it only causes problems. And if you have that and you think you're wise, you're lying to yourself. Uh, number two there, the characteristics, uh, characteristics of false wisdom found in verse 15. Verse 15 such, says, such wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So first of all, it is earthly. Uh, the idea here is it is limited to the pre present material world of time and space. Are there people that are wise when it comes to how things work here? Sure. Is that how God wants us? Is that the kind of wisdom that God wants us to have when it comes to dealing with one another and with the lost and dying world? No, obviously not. Notice it doesn't include or have space for God or spiritual things. It goes on to say that it is sensual. Uh, Jude one nineteen talks a little bit about this. It relates only to fallen, unredeemed man. When we say sensual, most of the time we think of sexual. Well, the idea is it relates to the senses. 
Okay, that's the idea of sensual. And so therefore, it would be something that you can see, hear, touch, taste, that kind of a thing. So it relates only to fallen, unredeemed man. And uh, what do we know about them? 1 Corinthians 2.14. But the natural man, the unsaved, unfa- the fallen, unredeemed man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, face it. We're not natural men and women. We're born again. We're redeemed. We're made into new creatures. And when we're reading the Word of God, things that we've read over and over and over again, all of a sudden, the Spirit illumines it. And it's kind of like, whoa, how come I've never seen that before? Well, when the Spirit illumines it, it's kind of like, oh, that really kind of makes sense. And you're saved. Now, take the Spirit out. What do they got? They have their senses. They're looking for empirical evidence, and God's Word doesn't work that way, and so they cannot receive it. Uh, Letter C, it is demonic. Uh, Again, you can check out Philippians 3.19 there. Its source is Satan working through demonic fallen angels. Okay, uh, Genesis 3.5, For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Did he tell the truth? Yeah, he did. And wrapped it around a lie. Were they going to be like God? No, unfortunately, there's a whole religion based on being like God. It's a lie that still works. You know, someday you could have your own planet and you could fill it with souls. And therefore, of course, you need more than one wife. It's called Mormonism. They are, uh, there's a video, I, we have it in the, well, we used to have it in the library, I assume it's still there, called the God Makers, uh, worth uh, looking at if uh, you don't know anything about them, because of course they are visiting our houses from time to time. Uh, but uh, it, you shall be like God, that's not true. You will know good and evil. Uh-huh. What did they know before? Only Good. I mean, God, if you go through chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis, you can see how God met every need that a person would have. And yet, they believed a lie and uh, fell. And we probably would have done the same thing. Notice number three, false teachers were and are a major problem throughout church history. Okay, their, their source of information, their source of inspiration, if you will, uh, they may use the Word of God, but then they turn it around and twist it and make it say things that that's not what God intended. And before you know it, they either have a bunch of girlfriends or they're really rich, um, or maybe both, who knows. <laughs> uh, those seem to be two areas that uh, Peter talks about a lot. They're very sensual in the, the way they approach life, and... Uh, They also are looking to get rich off of uh, their preaching. So false teachers have always been a problem, and those who have selfish ambition and bitter uh, envy, they are the ones that uh, their wisdom is earthly, sensual, demonic. Number three, the result of false wisdom, verse 16. For where envy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every kind of evil. So he starts out by repeating the motivation of false wisdom, envy and self-seeking, and this is what we get from it, confusion. God is not the author of confusion. He is a God of order, right? The word confusion there is akatastasia, uh, instability, that is disorder, commotion, confusion, tumult. It is used by Christ as one of the signs of His coming. There are going to be wars and commotions, that's the word in Luke 21, 9. Uh, wars and disorder, if you will. It's used by James of the double-minded man in chapter 1, verse 8, as being unstable in all of his ways. Okay, there's disorder, there's not, uh, there's a confusion. Uh, and then every evil thing are there. Not only confusion, but every evil thing. The word therefore uh, evil is phallos, uh, foul or flawy, uh, wicked, evil. It carries the idea of worthless or good-for-nothingness. I love how we can just put a ness on the end of it, and it kind of 
intensifies it. Right? Good for nothingness. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's the idea of every evil thing there. Uh, the word uh, thing is pragma. It's where we get the word pragmatic. It's a deed, an affair, an object, a material, a business, matter, thing, or work. So what comes from uh, envy and self-seeking? Disorder and worthless works. Remember what Pastor was talking about this morning? You know, Pastor and I can both tell you that we were trained theologically in, in the same school, ultimately. I, I mean, I only had to go there for a year because I was so smart. Uh, well, <laughs> I transferred in from other schools. Uh, pastor went there for a few years in Calvary Bible College. We got a good theological education, okay? Um, but the reality is, is uh, we were both kind of spiritually raised in churches that were relatively legalistic, very traditional, okay? Nothing wrong with being traditional. But when you have to follow all these rules and therefore you're putting a lot of effort into it, you're not walking in dependence upon the Spirit. You're walking in dependence upon yourself to do all of the things you're supposed to do. That is wasted time. Now, we did a lot of good things, okay? Uh, we taught Sunday school. We preached messages. We shared Jesus with people. Uh-huh. But if it wasn't completed by the filling of the Spirit, it was worthless. I've been saying it a little bit differently for quite a while. Uh, you can do, you know, Christ says, without me, you can do nothing. Well, the reality is, is we can do all kinds of things without Christ. We can teach Sunday school. I mean, we're not so stupid that we can't look, study, develop a lesson. We can do that. And to be honest with you, you know, I'm smarter than a lot of those kids that I might be teaching, so I can just go in there and off the cuff probably do some of this stuff, right? Uh, and someday it's going to go before the judgment seat of Christ and just burn up because it's worthless. That's the idea here, where there's uh, bitter envy and uh, self-seeking, selfish ambition. Uh, you may do things, but they're worthless in eternity's view. They may look good as far as humans are concerned, but in eternity's view, they're going to burn up. So every evil thing is there. Uh, letter C, true wisdom, verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, or peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, without favoritism and hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace." So uh, letter uh, number one there, the motivation of true wisdom, not bitter envy and selfish ambition, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Uh, the wisdom that is from above, uh, this is divine wisdom. It is God's gracious gift. In Matthew 7, 24, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, you, you, you see in that consistent thought coming forth? being a doer of the word and not a hearer only, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Or how about uh, the need for Christ for divine wisdom in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. But we preach Christ crucified. Yes, there's more there. But to those who are called, yes, there's more there, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. <laughs> So not only are we preaching Christ, right, but He lives in us. Therefore, we have the wisdom of God. It's, it's right there. It's already been downloaded into us. We have access to it, uh, and it's a godly, uh, God's gracious gift to us. Uh, it goes on to say it's first pure. The word for pure here is hagnos. Now, uh, if you've studied Greek, you know there's a, a word that comes up often, and it's the word hagios, and it means holy or holy one. Uh, it is translated uh, holy. It's translated saints. You know, Paul is writing to the saints who are in Ephesus. That's hagios. This is the same root word here for pure, hagnos. It means clean, innocent, modest, perfect, chaste, clean, and pure. It comes from hagios. It carries the idea of free of contamination or defilement. I don't know about you, but think about that with me for just a minute, okay? Uh, blessed is the pure in heart. You know, they're going to see God, right? And when we think of ourselves, 
very often we think of ourselves not like Paul thought of himself. We think of ourselves and think about all those things that we, we knew we shouldn't have and we did anyway, and how could God love me, and all that kind of stuff. Here's how. God downloaded into you the righteousness of Christ. When, when Paul is in Romans chapter 7 and he says, the things that I do, I don't understand. I want to do what's right. And I end up doing the th very thing that I hate doing. Who's talking? Paul, the new man. That's who's talking. The new man only wants to please God. Yeah, I know. We, we kind of struggle because we're dealing with that whole flesh thing. He calls the whole flesh thing a law of sin in my members. In fact, he goes so far as to say, when I do sin, it's not me. Why? Because I'm the new man. I've been redeemed. I've got this downloaded new nature going on thing going on, and, and it, it's not me. It's sin dwelling in me. And, and remember how he ends chapter 7? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Praise be unto God for Jesus Christ. So then, new man, with my mind, I'm going to serve the law of God. With this body, with this flesh, I'm going to serve the law of sin. In other words, I'm going to continue to struggle with this whole battle going on until I die. But me, I'm the new man. Okay? And so the same thing is here. We are holy ones. Yeah, God's working it out in our practice. And some of us are a little bit hard-headed. Well, some of you. Uh, no, some of us are a little hard-headed, and we get it wrong time after time after time. It's okay. Calm down. Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus, right? Now, should you be intentional about trying to get it right? Sure. But you need to understand, God sees you already pure, holy, without contamination because of the work that he has done. And so the wisdom that's from above is like that. It is pure. It is clean uh, without contamination. Number two, the characteristics of true wisdom. 17b, reflecting on the Beatitudes. Uh, notice I've, I've got them written down there. Uh, back there in pure, it's Matthew 5, 8. Uh, you'll see some more as we go along here. Uh, he has the word then um, in verse 17. Uh, the basis for making pure a motive and not a characteristic. Everything after this is characteristic. Pure is the motive for true wisdom. Okay? So, but the wisdom that is from above is for, first pure. Then we're going to start talking about characteristics, okay? So uh, first of all, number two there, peaceable. Uh, to pacify, uh, salutary, peaceable, uh, Matthew 5, 9, beatitude. Uh, gentle, uh, another Greek word there, appropriate, mild, gentle, moderation, patient, Matthew 5, 5, and verses 10 through 12. Number uh, four there, willing to yield, uh, I have uh, in my version it says compliant. Uh, good for persuasion, compliant, easy to be entreated. Matthew 5 3. Uh, so we see <coughs> me. this person is available to serve. Y you can ask them, and they're there to listen, to uh, hear, and uh, do what's necessary. In that situation. And then, of course, they're also number five, full of mercy, uh, compassion, human or divine, tender mercy. I, I don't know about you, uh, first time I took the spiritual gifts test, those of you that have become members of Edgemont Bible Church, one of the things that you do is you take a spiritual gifts test, and that's actually an inventory. It uh, shows you, uh, because of your experience, that's how you answer these questions, it shows you where. Uh, you've done things and it worked out good for you. And it shows you areas where you've done things and, well, you know, I didn't really like that so much. Uh, first time I took the spiritual gifts test, I scored uh, out of 24 possible, yay, I scored three on mercy. Uh, a few years later, I, I took it again and I, I scored six. Uh, Lynn scores 22, okay? Uh, that just kind of gives you a, a comparison. Uh, the last time I took it, I, I scored 10 on mercy. 
okay? Uh, you know, people talk about being without tact and all that kind of stuff. I'm not without tact. I, I just am direct. <laughs> um, the, the reality is, is uh, mercy has become one of my favorite, uh, if you will, uh, characteristics of God uh, because the more I've walked with him, the more I have lived in Romans chapter 7, the more I have noticed that, boy, God has been merciful to me. God has been merciful to me. God has been merciful to me. And then you see uh, Jesus' contention with the Pharisees, and uh, he points out that they totally missed mercy. Yeah, they'd follow the letter of the law, but totally missed mercy. And then you see passages where, judge not lest you be judged, Matthew 7, right? The uh, way you judge people, that's the way you're going to be judged. And I've noticed that God has been merciful to me. Can I tell you something? I think if I were to score uh, the spiritual gifts test now, I'd be way above 10, at least 11 or 12, okay? No, God really has done a work there. But the idea of uh, mercy, um, compassion, understanding that, okay, you blew it. No reason to live there. Let's get back up and get moving with God. You know what I'm saying? And then uh, full of good fruits, uh, the works that come from it. This is in comparison to every evil thing. Remember, when we're not filled with the Spirit, we could teach a Sunday school lesson, burns up in the judgment seat of Christ. Here, we're walking according to true wisdom, to God's gracious gift to us, and it's full of good works or good fruits, uh, the work that comes from it. Goes on to say, number six, that uh, it is without partiality, uh, undistinguished, impartial, without partiality. It is only used here in the New Testament. And uh, then we have uh, number seven, without hypocrisy, uh, undissembled, sincere, without dissimulation, uh, unfeigned. Uh, remember, Jesus condemned this sin most. Uh, Matthew 6, 2, again, within the Sermon on the Mount there, 6, 2, 6, 5, 6, 16, and 7, 5. Uh, he said to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You know, uh, at one point he's in the boat with them and they're crossing the lake and he goes, um, whatever the Pharisees tell you to do, do. They're God's leaders right now. But... Don't take on the leaven of the Pharisees. Remember what the disciples did? I, I didn't bring the bread. Did you bring the bread? Oh, man, we're in trouble because we didn't bring the bread. The leaven of the Pharisees is this hypocrisy where they, they want to look good before men, but they're not really worried about what God uh, thinks about them at that point. Um, he uh, says in Matthew 22, 18, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Uh, it was, again, one of the sins that he didn't like the most. Uh, next one down there, Matthew 23, 28, even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Again, dealing with their heart. You know, uh, when we talk about the word love, we know there are a couple of different words used for love, right? And what's God's type of love? Agape. Uh, can, can we say that uh, agape is a love that is willing to sacrifice for something? Okay, Because the Pharisees agaped the praise of men. So when we say it's God's type of love, yes, agape is used talking about God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? But notice, he wasn't doing it so he'd get something out of it. He did it so that we got something out of it. So it's a self-sacrificing love. And uh, they, were, they were willing to sacrifice to get the praise of men, but they weren't really ple uh, worried about uh, God's uh, praise. So uh, they were hypocrites. Number three, the results of true wisdom, verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. Uh, there is a causal relationship between divine wisdom and genuine righteousness and peace. Uh, again, the comparison is between those who have selfish ambition and bitter envy. What do they produce? Worthlessness, right? And those who have God's gracious gift, what do they produce? 
all of these characteristics that we've just looked at, and they're full of good works. And the idea of good works is when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to go through the fire and it's going to come out as gold, silver, precious stone. Okay? So there's a causal relationship between divine wisdom and genuine righteousness and peace. And again, when you're walking with God and you're doing the things that God wants you to do, you are at peace with Him. You feel peace, okay? Um, Number two, those that use godly wisdom show it through righteous speech, actions, and attitudes. In many cases, it will produce peace among those affected. So not only uh, does it uh, spread out to other people, but the person that is using godly wisdom is going to feel that peace also. Notice by those who make peace, believers have access to godly wisdom. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, notice, in the knowledge of Him. The more you get to know God, the more you understand how He wants things done, the more you are accessing godly wisdom, the more you're able to live the way God wants you to live. Uh, When we were talking to um, son-in-law, Jason, <laughs> last night. Um, one of the things that, you know, he, he's looking forward to the next Phil Robinson, uh, uh, whatever, podcast. That's good. I said, you know, there's one thing you want to do. You want to start getting in the habit of getting into God's Word for yourself. You know, I don't care if it's 15, 20 minutes in the morning. He goes, oh, there's no way I could do it in the morning. He goes, I'd have to do it at night. And I said, fine. Do it at night. There's no reason to be legalistic about this thing, right? But what we want to do is we want to start feeding that new man with what God has to say about things. Why? Because somewhere in the rush, not only are we building a foundation for life, if you will, we're building on the solid rock type thing, but uh, you never know when what's gone in. It's kind of like everybody who talks about daily devotions like, what does it mean? Or what does it say? What does it mean? And what does it mean to me? Like I'm going to get a, an application for today. You might not get an application for today. You might be building on that foundation so that when the time comes, it's there. Okay? And so uh, the more you know God, the more you understand how He wants you to behave, act, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got a... <coughs> Get a little bit more water in here. <clears throat> Lube the pipes. Paul's admonition to the same group, the church at Ephesus. See then that you walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. The idea of walking circumspectly. Down in Brazil, there's walls between most houses. Uh, both uh, between them. Out front, there's usually some uh, what we call gradi, fencing type thing. And on top of the walls, very often they would dump a little bit of concrete, mortar, and they would stick nails up or stick broken glass into it because they didn't want someone coming over the wall, okay? And it's amazing, if you have a cat, doesn't matter how many nails, how much glass is there, he walks along that wall and he puts his feet where there's no nails, no glass. No problem at all. That's the idea of walking circumspectly. You, you see in the danger ahead of time, and you're carefully putting your feet where they need to go. Uh, when we think of Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, uh, first, of course, you offer your body as a living sacrifice. You're understanding who's on the throne, and it's not you, right? And you're not to be conformed, not to be pressured into the world's thinking about things. Uh, please, understand I know Christian people that they get into some conflict within their marriage, and the, the first response is divorce. Kind of like, excuse me, we're walking circumspectly, not as fools, as wise. Now, sure, maybe they didn't walk circumspectly, and that's why they're where they're at, right? But what does God have to say about this whole subject? We have the answers, and, and yet... 
See what I'm saying? Or, uh, you know, uh, who do you think ought to be president? And they'll give you a name, and it's kind of like, really? Uh, you, you think that person ought to be? And it's not a, my preference compared to their preference. It's what does that person stand for? When we look at the Word of God, we recognize we don't want an awful lot of the people <laughs> that are running. Uh, but it's not because we don't like uh, this skin color or that uh, opinion about something. It's because they really don't do or want what God wants, okay? And so it says, don't be pressured into the world's shape, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So the more you're in the Word of God, the more it's changing you, the way you think, and you begin to understand how God wants you to be thinking about Pick your subject. One of the reasons why I love the book of Proverbs. <laughs> it's God's wisdom explained in all these different areas. Yes, I understand for the Jewish people, it was here's how you're going to be staying in the land, right? But there's a lot of wisdom for everyday life for all of us, even though we're not promised to stay in a land or something like that. But you're, you're being transformed. Why? So that you can test what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And, and again, we're not talking about this uh, perfect will of God as though there's only one person you can marry or anything like that. We're just talking about, okay, I've got uh, $600 uh, and I've got uh, $450 worth of bills and uh, I've already uh, given my tithe or, or however you're going to do that. Uh, so how am I going to use the rest of the money? Well, I want a new car. <laughs> Is, is that how God wants you to use the rest of the money? You know, occasionally we'll say it on Sunday morning, uh, our offerings, uh, that is uh, an acknowledgement that God owns it all. So you don't give some and then spend the rest of it the way you want. You're giving a portion, whatever you've determined between you and God, and the rest of it belongs to Him. How does He want you to use it? That kind of thing. Well, as you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, you start to understand the good, the perfect, acceptable, and perfect will of God so that it is producing that good fruit. So walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So that is the divine wisdom compared to worldly wisdom. And uh, it's interesting because, again, from chapter 1, chapter 2, here we are in chapter 3, we're seeing real faith lived out in different areas, and next week, though we will not be shooting, we're going to be talking about wars and conflicts between you, uh, because that was another area that faith needed to be lived out. Well, with that in mind, let's go ahead and close in prayer and uh, we'll let you go. Lord willing, see you Wednesday. Father, we do thank you again for your love, your care. We thank you for making us new people, for downloading everything that's necessary in us uh, you see us as already glorified, already complete, and we're learning how to uh, work that out in day-to-day -day living. So we would ask, Father, that you would continue to guide us, direct us, give us uh, this godly wisdom so that we might uh, put it into practice in our day-to-day -day living, not being filled with selfish ambition and uh, bitter envy, but uh, with uh, the purity of your wisdom and all of the characteristics that come from it. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. You are.